started this evening. Uh, I want to welcome all of you here this evening, Arlington Public Library, for our fiscal year 2018 budget presentation. This is the eighth year that uh, we have uh, done this kind of a presentation. And uh, we've gotten good feedback each year that we have done this. Uh, we, we find that people learn something when they come. We don't get a lot of attendance. The, you know, the attendance level isn't high, but uh, we take care of that by inviting many of our employees to come in. <laughs> and uh, you'll see uh, that uh, we do have many, many employees here this evening, but we appreciate those of you who are here this evening as well, who are not employees of the city of Farmington. We think that the city employees can learn a lot too with this kind of presentation. Um, but uh, city manager Rob Mays has done a good job of communicating with our city employees about what the fiscal year 2018 budget looks like. There'll be more communication as time goes on, but we're in the process now. And this is one of our scheduled phases of that process where we get this information out to people who are interested in, in the information, who want to understand a little bit better how their local government works. Do some introductions uh, first off, and then we'll proceed with the program. We have three city councilors here, I think just three. I, I don't see Councilor Cher, but uh, representing District 1 is Linda Rogers. Linda, thank you for being here. Linda is in her, she's about a year and a half in. She was appointed to take the place of Dan Darnell who terminated his third term early. So uh, Linda has been serving for a year and a half. We have representing District 3, Gayla McCulloch. Gayla is into her eighth year as a city councilor. Gayla, thank you for being here. And we have representing District 4, Nate Duckett, who is in his fourth year as a city councilor. We appreciate each of them being here and uh, taking the time out to be here this evening as well. In the past, we've asked uh, all of the city department heads who are here and other employees who are in the um, uh, room to stand up and to, be, and, and to introduce themselves. I think what we're going to do this evening is just ask you to stand. And I don't think we'll go through the introductions, at least at this point in the meeting. We, we may do that later. But would all the department heads please stand? Yeah, thank you for being here as well. And then uh, all other city employees, if you'd please stand. Yeah. So when we get to that question and answer part of the session, we'll have plenty of uh, information, plenty of answers here for you if you're asking questions. The format this evening is going to be Rob Mays, our city manager, is going to make the budget presentation. We'll ask that that uh, be not more than about 45 minutes long. It could be much longer than that. It uh, is a lot of information, but Rob will give an overview. And uh, then we're going to open it up to questions. I think each of you has been given a handout. I'm, I'm told that that is posted to our City of Farmington website. And so after the meeting, if you want to take a closer look at that information, you're welcome to do that. After my, Rob makes his pre presentation, again, we'll open it up to questions, try to provide answers. Not just questions, but if you have comments about what's going on in the city. We'd appreciate those comments as well. This is an appropriate time in the process for those questions to be asked and for comments and suggestions to be considered so that you know, if, if the council deems it wise, we could incorporate some of those things into the process as we go forward. You may ask your questions verbally by coming to the mic to ask the question, or we do have cards and uh, pencils in the back. If you'd like to submit a question in writing, some people feel more comfortable doing that. Uh, we'll try that this year to see if it uh, allows for more questions to be asked. Our target uh, termination time is 7.30, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started with it. Rob? So those of you with smartphones or, or little devices, if you go to FMTN, frankmarytomnancy.org, right on the front plate page, you'll see a link to be able to click to this. We're also going to test your ability to keep up with us. 
If you've noticed on your slides, they're a little bit, appear to be out of order. I'm told that when you transfer from the landscape to four slides, it switches them around if you want to keep them full size. And due to budget cuts this year, we had to go four slides per page. We couldn't afford three anymore. So you'll just start here. And we, do want to, we didn't want to kill any extra trees. So, but those, those are there for you. But again, you could follow along on your smartphones as well. I want to add my word of appreciation for those of you taking time to come tonight. Um, some of you have, have, have seen a lot of the material before. We always add a little bit of, of material to it, but we are going to, in terms of those of you that have been this before, I'm going to move very quickly through some of the introductory and big picture items and, and, and spend more time today actually talking about each of our departments and divisions and, and those budgets and what they, what they look like. And that'll, uh, I think, maybe you have different, maybe there's a particular department you have, you have interest in. So um, I'm going to just have to trust. We're also, I'm learning this new technology. It's beautiful, but I can't use my pointer. So I'm just going to have to trust the table over here. We have Teresa and Alina here that'll, uh, and I'll, I'll be worried the whole time that I have the, the right pages behind me showing up. But the first one is the trade area, right? No? So you see, we're already off to a bad start. My, yeah, here we go. Was, okay, so first we have our budget process and timeline. Again, uh, we start the budget, we're pretty much involved in the budget all the time. We finish up one budget and, we're, and we feel like we're almost starting the next year's budget. So it starts back in January with staff input, uh, frontline managers give input to the budget, moves through the process to where we are today here in May. This is the public budget presentation. And this will be kind of the last section of, of input. We've had a number of hearings with the council. Um, and then we'll be taking all that we hear and ultimately, according to state statute, the city manager is responsible to formulate that into a preliminary budget, present it to the mayor and council, and then they'll have at least two hearings after that uh, in May, uh, May 16th and 23rd, they're scheduled, where they'll do final deliberations on the budget and then ultimately adopt uh, the budget. <clears throat> so some background area, the city of Farmington trade area. All right. This is a very, very important picture to understand what's unique about Farmington. I get asked all the time, you know, about benchmarking questions and how we compare to other places. The fact is that Farmington doesn't really compare very well to almost anywhere. We're not just a city of 45,000 people, and you very well know that. And the services that we provide really have a, a, an impact far beyond that. At any given weekend, we're told we have 100,000 people here shopping and as many oftentimes you know you go to Walmart you'll see cars from Utah Arizona um, and Colorado as many oftentimes it feels like as many as you see from from uh, New Mexico and that's a good thing that's a there's some bad that comes with that sometimes but it's overall a good thing and certainly is is critical to, critical to our economic uh, uh, survival and, and the fact that we have really done quite well in the last 10 years in spite of the, the recession that we've had some stability in our resources because we are the retail hub for really an area of about 307,000 people. That's depicted in that, that circle, that, the Four Corners region. The federal government recognizes a, a trade area of 220,000 people. And as merchants and other places look at us, um, both through the, the understanding that we're also an MSA, they, they see us as a much larger market and a potential market for, for their businesses than, than the 45,000. So we're also designated by the federal government as an MSA. That's definitely a blessing and a curse. We're one of four MSAs in the state. So there are only four, Albuquerque, Farmington, Las Cruces, and Santa Fe. And you, understand, you see they're depicted, but it's not just Farmington. So when we read you know, articles in the newspaper or national reports in USA Today were the trailer park capital of the world or recently the fastest shrinking city, not in the world, in the United States, um, or crime issues sometimes or domestic violence or literacy issues. These are referring to the entire MSA. And certainly when you take the MSA as a whole, there are some economic and socioeconomic challenges within this MSA. But it includes all of San Juan County, 
all of the smaller cities, all of the unincorporated areas of, of San Juan County, and then uh, parts of the Navajo Nation as far out as Ticknos Pass, Sh Shiprock, Newcomb, Nagizi, and all those areas, all those stats are dumped into a pot and then measured and they're called Farmington when you read about that. Um, we recently had a good one that came out in the USA Today and we actually put it out on our website. The Farmington MSA registered as was it the number one cleanest air in terms of particulates in the air and most of you say it's hard to believe that but it's absolutely a fact and true put out by the American Lung Association. So when you read those things generally remember that it's all of San Juan County not just the city of Farmington proper. We continue to focus and take economic development very, very seriously through our partnership with Four Corns Economic Development. This is our regional economic development uh, agency. We have uh, some target areas that they're focused on and very active. Uh, the mayor and I are both on their boards and of course we're a, a member of that group. But we're also the, the, the number one financial supporter of that agency whereas as we contribute about $154,000 a year. And we've chosen our primary means, now our community development department does some focus on economic development issues, but our primary means at working towards uh, um, protecting jobs and uh, economic diversification, the primary focused strategic effort in that we do through our economic development arm, which is Four Corners Economic Development. We've continued to see a lot of good things happen, and these pictures are important. Uh, they don't just depict that we have a lot of, of new hamburger joints coming. They, they represent what's happening in, in, in our number one economic sector for, for gross receipts tax, and that's the retail sector. It's about 40% of our total revenue. And we talk in terms of both wanting to see that we want to see the pie expand, but we also want to see the depth and quality of that pie continue to improve because we need to maintain our place as this economic center for that economic trade area. So go back to that map real quick of our economic trade area, Alina. The, this is critical to us. One more. That star right there, that's where we want people to know that's where you go to shop. That's where you go for entertainment. That's where you go to, to spend the night and go to a concert and go to our stores and sleep in our hotels and bring economic revenue dollars from the outside into Farmington and many, many people depend on those. So now you can go back to those pictures and Lena went out and took these pictures and did a great job. Last year I sat here and talked about this illustration of quantity and quantity of the pie in terms of hamburgers. We were getting a lot more hamburger places and in my opinion, great new quality hamburger places. But the debate, the debate is always, are we selling more hamburgers? I would argue that we probably are selling more hamburgers, but that's not the only question. We need to, again, be the place that everybody in that 220,000 or 300,000 wants to go because that's the place to go get hamburgers. This year, it's about makeup, the illustration. <laughs> we used to sell a lot of makeup, I'm sure, at Walgreens and Walmart and other places, but now, again, in maintaining the, the reason to come here and to spend the night and shop, now makeup is one. Ulta comes to town. It comes into the mall, and then what happens right on the, on the tails of that? What's the other one called? Sephora. So again, the, the, the depth and quality of the pie grows, and that's important to maintaining our, our economic advantage for having people come here. There are certain types of retail establishments that we want here. We don't want them in Durango. We want those people to come here. And so these are exciting things, and it's good to see. And it's not all restaurants. We've had hotels and other, other things as well. This is a familiar chart. This is our 40 year. I keep checking, I'm trying to have, I'm trying to have faith. I just, I need a mirror. I just don't have it in me. I just don't have it in me. I'm not a trusting soul apparently. But, because uh, I always can try to read the looks on your face. Is, is, is the looks on your face just, you know, I really don't get this guy or is it because you're secretly laughing that I'm talking about the wrong, the wrong slide. Plus I've got a new mic that's really throwing me off. I've, I feel like, like a rap singer or something. And, you know, so, so. But our 40 year GRT chart, you know, it's, I, I like to laugh about, I would have liked to have enjoyed one time being city manager between 1978 and uh, 2009, um, but I didn't. My world's after that. And you see, of course, really is a new world. And we kind of call it the, the new economy. I don't know that 
we'll go back to anything like those days of double digit tax growth, you know, almost year over year. I'm just not sure that's sustainable in the, in the new energy economy of, of the, the, the kind of availability of natural gas there is everywhere. But we still have a, a great asset and I think will be an important part of our, of our uh, economy. The next slide kind of blows up between 2008 and beyond it, and it kind of shows the picture. So I came into office as city manager in 2008 and it took me about a year to, work, to ruin the world's economy uh, because we fell in 2009 and a global recession hit and we fell about 17.5% in, in one year. And then you kind of see how we've, how we've kind of gone up, ebb and flowed back and forth uh, for these last eight or nine years. And where we stand today at the end of our projected FY 2017, we're projecting to be about 14% in tax revenue, in actual dollars coming, GRT dollars, than we were in 2009. So if you think about that in terms of your household income, if you were making 14% 14 less today than you were in 2009, that's exactly the, the city's situation. And of course, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, the red line depicts inflation. So during that same eight or nine years, we have not only do we have 14% less tax dollars, the spending power of each of those $1 has diminished by 15%. So in a very real way, the city of Farmington is operating in terms of a ratio of spending power to tax dollars at a 26% negative uh, deficit between what we had in 2009. Hence what we call it the, the new economy, the new city of Farmington. We don't even think back to recovery as identified as it'll be like it was in 2009 again. We know we will always have to maintain the kinds of efficiencies that we, we have today. The, the statement doing more with less is, is more than just a saying to us. We objectively can prove we have less money, 26% in terms of spending power. We have 37 less employees than we did in 2000. So we are doing more with less, less people and less tax, less tax tax revenue. Some of that's been made up by technology advances and certainly efficiencies and looking for ways to, to, uh, to eliminate waste, but, but frankly we just have an incredibly dedicated team of employees that are doing more with less. During that same time frame we have not diminished any of our services, we have not cut back any hours of operation, we in fact have enhanced and added services even at a time when we have 26% less spending power in terms of GRT tax dollars than we did then. This next slide gives you a sense of gross receipts by sector. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but it, it illustrates again the importance of the retail and the service sector in a, in a changing economy. We are much more diverse than we were in 2008 and prior to that. Um, oil and gas is extremely important to us, but we see, we've seen other sectors recover. In fact, every other sector has essentially recovered from the, from the fall of 2010, or now when I say fall, not, not like spring, summer, fall, I mean the fall, all but the oil and gas sector have, have recovered. Let's go to the next slide, Alina. This is an important slide that's near and dear to our hearts, and this is one that we preach everywhere that we go and that we want our citizens to understand and be aware of how taxes work. I noticed on the Daily Times blog today, or not blog, on the uh, Facebook page today, an article about our budget hearing yesterday. And somebody's comment was, uh, they're, they're taxing our small businesses out of existence. That was their, that was their comment to that, to that article. Well, we're not taxing anyone's business. In fact, we are, I'm gonna make a case for you that the city of Farmington is the lowest tax city potentially in the state of New Mexico, at least by the argument. The first box on your left, that is the only box that your elected officials have any control over, the city of Farmington's tax rate. And you'll see we are second to the bottom with Albuquerque at 2.6625%. Again, that's the only one we control. You see what some of the surrounding cities stack up there, uh, and many cities around the state are, are over 3%. three the next box is what's is stacked on top of our jurisdiction, and that's San Juan County's taxing authority. 
And so you see they're up in kind of the middle range at a little over 1%. So that's stacked on top of our 2.66%. City of Farmington officials have no control over that, that tax rate. And then finally, the third box is the state rate. And the state then tax, tax on 3.9% on top of everything else. So you see in the far right box our total. When you go to Walmart, you only see Farmington tax rate at 7.625%. Good job on the, that's good. That's really, that's good. that's good. And people think that the city of Farmington controls that, and they think the Farmington, city of Farmington gets all that revenue. The fact is we do not get that revenue. We get 2.6625%, that's it. And I'm gonna show you again the kind of restraint that your leaders have, have shown in, in taxes in just a minute. Now that 7.625, let me put that in some perspective so you understand what that means. So again, of the 7.625%, Farmington gets the 2.6625, you'll see that there by the purple. You, you correlate that to every dollar then collected of GRT. We get 35 cents. So every dollar that you pay, the city of Farmington only gets 35 cents of that. And now you see where it goes the rest of the places. The county gets 14 cents, or again, a little over 1%, and the state gets 51 cents, or almost 4%. So everybody got that, and you're ready to take that message to the masses and, and uh, defend your city government. What's interesting, I, remember I told you I made the case that we're the lowest taxed, at least by any comparable full-service large city? Look at the left side of your screen here. On the, on, the farming, on the property tax. All of the taxing entities here have been very conservative on property tax. Albuquerque, if you remember on that chart, if I go ahead and go back to it, Alina, or whoever's running that, is the only one of the major cities that's got a lower GRT rate than us at 2.4. Of course, that translates over here to their full rate of 7.3. Um, but our property taxes are 86% cheaper than Albuquerque's. Another way to say that is they, theirs are 86% more than ours. So if you, if you take that into account with any kind of a conservative formula to say of a typical citizen who lives in Farmington or Albuquerque, their GR, you might pay a little bit less GRT at the cash register, but you're gonna pay a lot more either the form of your rent or your property taxes to cover that 86% increase. So I take that together to make the case, and I think a fairly strong one, that Farmington should, should understand that they are likely the lowest taxed city or lowest tax residents in the, in the state of New Mexico. And we should be proud of that, uh, not just in and for itself. We wanna, obviously taxes have a purpose and all of our services are, are, are primarily paid for by taxes, and, but we need to be good stewards of every dollar that we have. Now here's the tax rate history that I just wanna keep you in mind again to kind of illustrate the conservative nature. Up until 2016, when the state of New Mexico forced the city of Farmington to raise taxes, and I'm gonna make that case in a minute as to why we truly were forced, um, we had not raised taxes since, since uh, 1998. So if you go across the bottom, the chart picks up at 2003, but we had not raised taxes all the way back since 1998, and I think that was a referendum on some quality of life projects that the citizens voted on. Um, but you follow across the bottom, you'll see that in that, so across the yellow, we didn't, we didn't raise taxes until 2016. You'll see during that same period, the, the county raised taxes four times, and during that same period, the state of New Mexico raised taxes twice. But I, for the, but I really need you to focus in on the state of New Mexico 2005, where you see that they raised taxes by one half percent. That is the year of the infamous hold harmless decision. So in an effort, well-meaning effort in 2005, our state legislature, certainly outside of the control of any local governments, in good intentions, decided to add food and medicine to the special interests of exempted items in our tax base. Right now, about 50% of the entire tax base is exempted from gross receipts taxes by very special interests. That leaves only 50% of the tax base. Now, what does that automatically intuitively tell you? The tax rate has to go what if you cut the base down? 
it has to go up if the same dollars are going to be raised. And it, likewise, if you added that tax base back and spread it back out, what would the rate do? It would naturally go down. So in, in 2000, simultaneously to doing this really good thing of taking tax off of food, I remember thinking that was a good idea at the time because I was an ignorant citizen at that time and had no idea how the local services that I was enjoying in the parks and the libraries and, and the police and the fire, how they were paid for. I don't, I don't want to pay tax on food. Who does? Um, and, I, and I knew, like everybody else, that government was ignorant and wasteful and evil, and so I was, I was all for it. But come to find out that none of that was true. But simultaneously to taking, moving tax on food and medicine down to zero, they raised it at a half percent on everything else. So the poorest of the poor might have benefited to some extent by food being untaxed, but the poorest of the poor didn't really pay tax on, on food. But they still have to buy tennis shoes and diapers and you know, clothes and school supplies for their children. And they paid a half percent more on all of that. And the state put that tax on to fund what was called hold harmless. They recognized in shrinking the tax base down by taking something as huge as food and medicine out, cities and counties, who particularly cities that rely on GRT, could not withstand that kind of loss in our tax base. So they said, well, no, no problem. We'll raise it a half on everything else, and we'll give you that money. We'll slip it to you, back channel it, and call it hold harmless, and we'll keep paying you just as if taxes was being collected on food and medicine. And that's very, very important. But you fast forward to 2016, and they started, they said, no more, we're going to renege on that promise. Oh, and by the way, we're going to stop paying you the whole harmless, but guess what we're going to keep? The half percent tax. You know, certainly the citizens have forgotten that when we raised taxes that we told them that was to fund their local services. That's where we stand today. So that's why I say we were forced, and I'll illustrate that in two slides from now. In fact, I'm going to actually skip over the next slide, go straight to this. This is the impact of that state's decision on that day. They took 14% of our GRT and just pulled that piece of the pie right out. That's why they knew cities could not withstand that. So they put in the half and said, we'll keep paying you that piece of the pie that in our case is worth $6.6 .6 million. But now, that's being phased out over 15 years, that, that piece of the pie that they're taking out. They're taking out a slice every year in a multiplying way till it totals 6.6 .6 million. The problem is, they said, and we're going to keep the half percent in place and keep that for our general fund. Oh, and by the way, uh, Mayor Roberts and City Council, here's three-eighths of new taxing authority. You tax it. And that's what had to happen in 2016 when we put on two of the three eights that the state said we're going to give you to replace that piece of the pie. The problem for us is that it's almost, it's, it's, it's inevitable under the current law, we'll have to put in the third eighth. All three of those eights combined are only worth $5.8 million, and the state's taking $6.7 million from us. So you can see why Hold Harmless is such a huge issue to local governments in an action that the state took that we have no control over. This is why when we are lobbying our state legislators and governor, and it's all under a theme of let's eliminate these loopholes, let's eliminate these special interest exemptions, let's put everything back in the tax base and lower the rate in half. How would you like to hear an announcement that the taxes in Farmington were cutting in half? That'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? I think that'd be a big win for our state legislators and governor. <laughs> And, but that would imply everything's got to pay their fair share. You put everything back in so that the rate can be lowered on everything else. Um, Representative Taylor and uh, former Representative Taylor and, and uh, Sen Senator Scher have introduced legislation that, 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 that is that type of radical tax reform. But our perspective is even if we can't get all the way back to that, anything that's put back in the tax base that allows us to be able to lower the tax rate. I can guarantee you my mayor and city council would like to vote to lower taxes. And if, and if food was put back in the tax base, they'd be probably pretty quick to get rid of those whole harmless increments that they had to put in. And of course now the state can't afford to keep paying the, the whole harmless and so we're in, a, we're in the dilemma with a bankrupt state. 
you see the impact on the chart of this 15 years. So we're in the third year of that phase out, FY 2018. So this year alone, they're taking 1.336 million from us. That's, the, that's the, the new increment this year. And in the three years, it's totaled up to 2.6. But now see how it goes from there. Next year, 1.7, on down every year until finally it reaches the full 6.6. And then you see the cumulative, 53 million by the end of the 15 years. And the state said, we're taking this. You raise taxes on your local citizens. We said, we haven't had to raise taxes since 1998. We don't want to raise taxes. Sorry. We're keeping the half percent. You have to raise taxes or find a way to live without that chunk of the pie. Go back, show my chunk of the pie. And that's a lot of services. That's a lot of police officers. That's a lot of firefighters. That's a lot of parks. That's a lot of library to be lost into our, our services. Um, to put that in perspective, that 1.3 million that they're taking this year, when we're talking about diminished, you saw my chart of the diminished taxes, that 1.3 million that they've taken represents 3.6% of this year's GRT. So when we start talking in terms of a few percent of growth and projecting some growth to help balance our budget, the law of the land right now, the state's taking the equivalent of 3.6 from us. All right, property tax. I mentioned earlier that all of the taxing authority entities have been quite conservative in this area. We have very low property taxes, particularly compared to, like I showed you, to, to Albuquerque, 86% cheaper. But where do your property taxes go? I just showed you how the GRT works. We have control of a very small percentage of it in total, property tax is even more dramatic. For every dollar of property tax that a property owner in Farmington pays, here's where it goes on that, on that uh, scale there. The San Juan County gets 29 cents of it. Farmington Municipal Schools gets 42 cents of it. State of New Mexico takes six. San Juan College takes 17. And just to humor me, how much do we get? Six cents. The average house in Farmington pays $93 a year total in property taxes. So in the big picture of things, your city services that you're used to having are not paid for by property tax. Our entire property tax revenue, 1.6, two, you can say it out loud. About two million total of our, of our revenues come from, from uh, property tax. So obviously it's a small piece of the puzzle. And so when you think about property tax, think about your funding primarily education and the county. When you think about GRT, you're funding the state and the city about equally and the county taking about a third of it. Okay, we're proud of a, a couple other things in the big picture. Our, our um, electric rates are one that we're very proud of. Um, right now as they stand, we're about 13.5% less than Aztec with the proposed rate increase they have before their commission right now in 2018 that will move to where we're 21 percent cheaper than them and in 2019 to 16 percent cheaper we're cheaper than them um, you see some of the dramatic 50 50 percent cheaper than than uh, La Plata and one of the things that's, that's, that, that's coming up a lot nowadays is this discussion about Bloomfield and I was asked not too long ago by somebody who really ought to know better, well, why aren't you just letting Bloomfield have our utility? Well, let me give you the five reasons why, very quickly, why we're not just letting Bloomfield take uh, their, the utility in their city. Number one, it's our lawful territory. It's been paid for, developed, invested in for over 60 years by the Farmington Electric Utility. Those are our customers. We own it. It is a business that we own. It's not something that we even legally can just say, take it, you know, we want to be good neighbors to you. Number two, those are our customers, and what's best for our customers is to stay for rates and reliability is to be with Farmington. Look at the comparison rates. Aztec rates range between 13 and 50% higher than ours, depending on which class of customer. Is that just because, you know, Hank and I are just that much smarter than our friends at Aztec? No, it's not. I mean, maybe we're a little, no, I just said. <laughs> but no, they have run a good utility. They have experience running a utility. It's simply a matter of business economics 
and the, and the, and the law of, 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 um, of economies of scale. They just simply cannot do it as cheap as we can at that tiny little scale. So another reason, that's why we are fighting for our customers, that it's not possible for them to maintain the rate structure that we have, no matter what they think they can do in good faith. Another one is for economic development. Our large industri industry base that's, it's, that's, that, that drives much of the economy for San Juan County is located outside of the Farmington city limits. And they regularly negotiate and say, if our rates were not as low as they are, they'll leave, take their jobs somewhere else. So we're fighting to keep low rates countywide for all of our, our large industrial customers. I mentioned economies of scale benefit everyone. We are stronger together than we are divided. The fact is we'd love for Aztec to join. The more, the greater economies of scale that we can create, the better economies of scale and, and, and economies we can pass on to our customers. We'd love for Aztec to join and have our lower rates. And we would have the benefit of, the, of a larger utility to continue to spread those, those costs out. So we don't apologize for the fact that we are defending ourselves in a lawsuit uh, by the city of Bloomfield to take our territory and our customers. We think it's best for everyone involved. And then last but not least, you know, we've also offered Bloomfield a very, very um, good revenue sharing plan to reward them for, for their customers through, a, through a, our, a, our, what do we call it, our franchise. franchise plan. So that's enough on that, but I need to say a little bit more about that, but it's becoming more and more of an issue in the news and, and more and more people are having questions because you hear one side of it and it, it, it kind of feels like we're the, we're the big bad bullies that are just not being nice to our, to our neighbors and that's just not, not the case. Water rates, we're very proud of our performance there. On water, we are um, 30, about 30% 30 below the state average, 161% lower than Santa Fe and of course they dodged that uh, soda tax today. We, I, would have, I, I was going to add a sheet on comparison soda prices to Santa Fe. And you can see um, as you move down the, the line there, but we're, we're, we're really very good there. The only two big cities cheaper than us are Albuquerque and Las Cruces, and they really aren't apples to apples. They use primarily groundwater from freshwater wells, which is entirely a different system for treating and pumping and storing. And so it's not even really an apples to apples comparison. So we're doing very well. So not only are we the lowest taxed citizens in Farmington, not only do we have the lowest electric rates, we have very, very competitive water rates. And by the way, we have award-winning water, just in case you know. And a safe water supply, as we were able to demonstrate through our ability to protect uh, our, our citizens from the gold mine spill through our protecting uh, Lake Farmington Reservoir. Okay, now moving to some specifics on the budget. I'm on schedule. I have, I, I have until five till. All right. <laughs> And everybody wants to hear from me. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Okay, here's a big picture of our budget. So this is now the FY18 budget in its broadest form. $289 million budget. Primarily the things you're going to be hearing me talk about tonight are pretty much the upper left green. Those are, that's the $72 million of our budget that we call in the 101 fund, the 201, and the 202. That's our, that, this is our GRT tax-supported basic services. And then we have part of that GRT that's dedicated that must be spent on streets and a part of that GRT that must be spent on parks. That's why they're shown in three areas. Most of what you're going to hear me talk about is really about those. And then down in the lower right-hand corner, you see the, the, between the, the utility enterprise funds, that's about $173 million of the budget in those four enterprise accounts. And by enterprise, what that means is those are essentially operations that we run like a business. They run as a business. They're not profit motivated, but they're designed to, to the, the rate payers pay, and we keep the money in those funds, and it goes back into the inf infrastructure. So that $289 million budget, how does that compare kind of to the state? You'll see, you know, we're the, it, and it makes sense, it kind of goes back to the four MSAs. We are the fourth largest governmental 
organization in the state of New Mexico in terms of cities or counties. Um, in fact, in, in many cases, colleges as well. Um, this year's budget's about 289 million. The, the comparisons there are last year's comparisons. So you see kind of a comparison of, of where we stand. And I always find that interesting to have some perspective, but it goes back to that very first slide. Farmington does not fit any benchmarks. We're not a city of 45,000 people. Cities of 45,000 people don't have 130 police officers. They don't have a Walmart, two Walmarts. They don't have a Sam's Club. They don't have a mall, a mall like we have. They don't have the people that we have. We have to have, we have, to have <coughs> services for all those guests. You go into any of our parks on a given Saturday, you will see people clearly coming from all over the region to use our parks, and that's exactly how we want it. They come here, they're our guests, and we rely on them economically. They shop, they go to a movie, they spend the night, they go to restaurants, they use our facilities, they check out books, don't they, Karen? And by the way, Karen, thank you for hosting us again. You and your staff always do such a good job. By comparison, um, the city of Farmington is about two times the size of San Juan County's government. We're about three times the size of San Juan College, two times the size of Farmington Municipal School. So it kind of gives you some perspective on the big, the big picture. Skip the next slide and let's go to the sources of revenue. So back to those GRT supported, the upper left, the green. Here's where your tax dollars, where they, how, where they come. And the, obviously the biggest one that supports the points I've been making early about GRT, over 70% of our revenue comes from gross receipts tax. So when you visualize cutting a 14% piece of the pie out of the blue, you get a sense of the impact on the whole. And then to illustrate property tax, again, only 2.7% of our whole. And then down around, you see some other areas that you can look closer at in your notes. Are you able to follow me now reading? Uh, you've learned to read right to left now? It's a new skill, that's great. Where does the money go? Same thing, these are the, these are the tax supported those $70 million funds. You see the, the, the largest is obviously police and fire, you know, making up uh, a little over a third of the, the entire budget. Public works, a big chunk, obviously that's all of our roads and streets. That's expensive things we do in public works. You see parks and rec, that's something we are very proud of. You would, I would dare say, Corey, how many cities would you go to that would have nearly 20% of their budget going towards parks and rec. Don't contradict me now if I'm wrong. Very few. And that's by design. Our city leaders made a decision and our, and our citizens supported taxes to say, we don't want to be just a dusty oil filled town. We want to be a town that offers a, a variety of reasons to live here. We embrace and love our oil and gas and mining and extractive industries, but we want to be a place that other people want to live here places people want to raise their families and a, and a quality of life. And our parks and rec programs, our library, and these other things are important to that. All right, here's the budget in a nutshell. I'm gonna kind of walk you through this. This is our balanced budget worksheet and how we got there. If you read the article in the paper today, you, the, the, it was I was correctly quoted. We started this year's budget process with about a $6 million deficit. So what does that mean? That is taking the, begin, the very first budget that we began with, our draft budget, that was taking all the department's needs, and a very important, that, but that carried over. This year, we made some major, major contingency cuts, a little over $2 million of contingency cuts this year. All of those were carried over into the expenditure budget. Uh, we projected GRT as a starting point at level to this year's projected actual. And putting those two together, we had a $6 million difference between revenue and expenses. So we've got to find $6 million. Essentially, how we did it was we are projecting GRT to, to have some reasonable growth this next, next year on an annualized basis. Probably, hopefully, maybe halfway through the year, we'll start to see some improvement of um, four and a half percent. That's, um, give me the dollar amount, Teresa. What is that, 1.4? 1.2 million. We cut an additional 2.4 million on top of 
the, one, the 2.1 that we had already cut the previous year. So we have trimmed this budget down to its bones. I would have thought that it was already trimmed down to its bones, but it, it really is. And then <clears throat> we have allocated from our cash reserves about 2.399 million. Now allocated from cash reserves doesn't mean that it's gonna, a check's gonna be written to spend it. It just means that's, that's the tool available through the ebb and flow of this budget year as revenues flow in and expenses go out that there's the possibility in a so-called worst case scenario that we would spend 2.4 million. But if we don't allocate that cash, we have to cut another 2.4 million of expenses. And that would be on top of the 2.1 that we cut this year and carried into next year. It would be on top of the 2.4 that we cut this year out of the department budgets. And I'm gonna show you where we cut them in a minute. And that would be another 2.4. And I can assure you that at that point, we would absolutely be taking police officers off the street. We would absolutely be closing facilities, closing parks. There's no possible way to get to that list. And the council has had to weigh those priorities and say that's the point we want to stop and say, this is the rainy day. We're going to dip into that cash reserve. And the good news is we have made cash available over the last several years, but have never had to use as much as was allocated. So there's still a, a, a pretty strong cash reserve. That we can say, okay, since we believe things a year from now will likely be a little better than they are now, let's not cut things now. Let's see if this cash can carry that over the bridge. And we do have some contingencies still. Um, we have an emergency line item and some, and that we could look at um, in, a, in a small little savings account. I'll show you in a minute to hedge ourselves against that that, that four and a half percent revenue increase. But I, I actually believe we're gonna get there and I'll, I'll show you my, my thinking, at least illustrate it for you in a, in a minute. Uh, we riffed eight more employees this year in this budget to make these cuts for a grand total of, and my, watch all my department heads literally get sick in the face when they hear about this, especially Mary, she's down two of her four planners. Um, that's a total of 37 employees we've riffed that as they were vacant, we haven't had to lay anybody off, but these are huge dollars. In fact, through reductions in vacancies and also in um, changeover of positions, we had a lot of people retire that were on the top end of the scale by people starting at the end. Our actual, our actual wages and benefits in this year's budget is uh, $1.1 million less than it was this year. So, you know, we're, that's a good thing. We're, we're holding those costs. And that's in spite of the fact of, in part of those cuts, we're reducing our, our pay plan down from, to only inc include a 2% cost of living. We've waived out any longevity merit or steps. And um, coal, our inflation this year is 2.7. So we're hoping that we can give our employees 2% and try to keep, keep up with that inflationary number. But even with that included, our wages and benefits are about $1.1 million less than this year. Came down to about eight minutes. Cash reserve, we have about $10 million available in cash reserve from two different funds. Our state requirement based on this year's budget is about 4.7. The council is saying at this point they have not adopted it, but the budget that I proposed says that we would make available in a worst case scenario, about 2.4 million from that 10 million. Let's go to the V chart. So here's kind of a premise that, that, we're, that we're looking at that we think is reasonable. No one has a crystal ball. If I did, I'd be in Vegas. But if we follow the trajectory from 15 to 16, we'll see we fell about 10%. I think it is reasonable to assume that over the next two years, we might make up that 10% incrementally. So, but we're, so if, if 2018 mirrors 2016, we'll, we will come in at 6% above this year or 51 million, and we are gonna budget and hope for 50 million or four and a half percent. So we're hedging a percent and a half there. We have about another, you know, an emergency um, contingency money, another couple percent that we can hedge against that four and, a half, four and a half. So we feel like it's a reasonable place to start the year. And so we don't overreact, we'll see. You think about a year ago, we had no rigs in the field. We have four now, and we have lots and lots of good news about, about work going on. So I think one thing we're all, we think next year will be better than this year. The question is how much better, how sustained, and how soon will it 
Okay, let's skip through the next couple slides. Go all the way to the first departmental slide. I want to walk you through very quickly these departmental slides. They take you through each of, our, each of our budgets and you get a feel for kind of where, where these cuts have been. Um, I'm okay for seven more minutes, right? It'll be done at seven, and then 30 minutes, some questions? Okay. All right, city administration and support. Uh, this is the, the mayor, city council, city manager's office, city clerk, city attorney, administrative services. That's all of our accounting, purchasing, um, information technology, all of, that's all of our computer systems and human resources. These are our service departments that serve the whole. And we, we operate under an efficiency model where we share resources and create economies of scale by not duplicating efforts in these internal service area. The budget in this areas are down about 3%. You're gonna see in all these departments, they're down between about two and five. There are some exceptions, but that's across the board what we're seeing is, is additional to cuts. Again, that's on top of the cuts we made this year. If you take $2 million, that's about 2.92% of our total budget for all those, those, uh, those eight departments. If you take out about $2 million of intergovernmental, things like the telephone systems citywide, um, are one, a little over 1.2% of emergency contingency, which is budgeted in this line item. In reality, we're only spending just over 2% of our entire budget on this kind of overhead piece. And that's, we think that's very, very good. And that exceeds benchmarking of, of other governmental entities. Municipal court, led by Judge Bill Lease and part-time Judge Bill Stanley, a 5% reduction in their budget expenditures. We're actually starting to see a little bit of decline in, in some of our jail, jail fees. Um, so we're, 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 we're budgeting down about 5% there. Library. Library's got about a 3% reduction in the coming years. We have a great library, we have 358,000 visitors last year. Um, that's over 1,000 a day, it's probably closer to 1,100 a day that come into this building, and uh, over 1,200 circulations a day, checking out something online or picking up a book. So very busy, very viable library, and all of our departments have done a great job of sustaining quality, not only of their buildings, but also of their people and of the ultimately the service that we deliver to our public in spite of these cuts. General services and support division, this handles our building maintenance, uh, vehicle maintenance. We have 256 buildings that the city owns and 938 vehicles or large pieces of equipment. Again, about a 2% cut in that budget. Airport, Mike, 30 seconds, get up and do a commercial about our airport. Mike Lewis, our airport manager. For those of you who've been flying on Tarnigan, you've uh, realized that in October 1st last year, Great Lakes really increased the number of flights out of Tarnigan. And since then, from October 1st to today, they've only canceled 13 flights. So we need to spread the word that the, 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 the uh, service is dependable. Uh, and most of those flights were canceled in December, January, and February, and it was due to Denver weather. So get out there, get on that airplane, and uh, give them a chance. They've introduced, uh, in December, they introduced the 30 passenger cabin class airplane. So now you can go to Denver or to LA on this airplane and have a bathroom, flight attendant, a little snack, maybe a drink, whatever you need. Thanks, Mike. So we're, we're, our, our airport has suffered. There was changes in FAA regulations and pilot shortages, but we're seeing our airline reemerge, and, and I think people starting to trust. I was talking to several business people that had flown in last week and used our airport again and really happy to see that happening. Our airport costs are up this year, but this is driven primarily, it's a good thing. The, the, if, if we get more grant money from the FAA, we have to increase our grant matches. And so we received about double the FAA funding or projecting for next year than we had last year. Red Apple Transit runs 17 buses. We just won an award as the only transit in the New Mexico that had increased ridership this year. Um, again, it's a little bit odd that the price, the, the, roughly an uh, equal level budget, the net cost is up a little bit, but again, the same thing. It's all based on grant matching. But to understand how the Red Apple works, it's highly subsidized by the federal government. So you see our cost of the Red Apple Transit so 17 buses running eight routes is about $1.1 million, you'll see in the bottom of your slide. The net cost of the city is only $398,000. 
Uh, not only, but you know what I mean. So the bus transit system is a 65% subsidized by the federal and state government, primarily the federal government. So you can think of transit as really a, a federal program. The city pays about 35% of those, of those costs. Parks, recs, cultural affairs. 1,819 acres of land. How many parks in the city limits, Corey? Seven. 57 parks, 128 medians, eight softball fields, 15 baseball fields, on and on it goes. We maintain free of charge fields at San Juan College and a variety of fields for Farmington Municipal Schools that we pay for for them. Expenditure cuts in parks and recs operations about 5% this year. Rec programs at the Farmington Rec Center, a reduction of about 4%. Parks and Rec Lake Farmington, this is a, a real exciting story. It's actually up in cost because we've expanded the lake. We had an overwhelming successful summer in our first summer. We had over 400 cars a day went through the gates and utilized the services during last summer. We've doubled down, we've increased the size of the uh, of the beach, we were adding security, adding services, adding venues out there. But you notice this one, there's not a net cost, there's actually a net credit. There's actually a, a revenue projection that uh, we've, you know, we'll see if it's quite that much, but Lake Farmington is not gonna cost the taxpayers anything. In fact, we'll actually provide some net revenue that we can use to reinvest back into development of Lake Farmington as a, as a recreation uh, hub. The next thing we're working on is phase one of a, of a dry camping area. Farmington Indian Center, reduction of 4% in their budget. Sycamore Park Community Center, reduction of 2% in expenditures, reduction 4% of net, net cost. Aquatics are very, very expensive. Uh, Farmington Aquatic Center and Lions Pool, uh, budgets are about level, slight increase, but revenue continues to dwindle as more and more people are, are, less people are using those pools, and so they're just very, very expensive, almost $800,000 a year to operate those pools. Pitney Hills Golf Course, in my mind, is a huge success story. We, this year, had about a $200,000 subsidy from the general fund, taxpayer subsidy. We're very conservatively budgeting our revenues, so it could go as high as 238,000 this year. But to give you a benchmark by comparison, um, San Juan County's golf course, they subsidize theirs by $467,000 a year. So golf courses are very expensive. In, the, in this economy, rounds are down nationally. This continues to be a great draw for our area, and we're running a great golf course and, and doing it at a, a very good price with a very minimal subsidy in comparison to other areas. Civintan Golf Course, about a 2% reduction in expenditures. Farmington Animal Shelter, let me stop there a minute. Fairly, about a 3% actually expense increase there, but a net cost decrease of about 7%, primarily related to, we have been highly subsidizing, we, we partner with San Juan County, they bring their animals here. They're about half the animals, half of them come from Farmington. Over the last several years, We've been highly subsidizing San Juan County's contract price with us, and they have agreed to, to kind of phase out that subsidy. So they're, they're increased closer to what their true cost is this year, and we're very happy about that. Very proud of our animal shelter. They took in 77,271 animals last year. Now just stop and put that in some perspective. These are real living, these aren't widgets you can stack in the corner, right? These are living things that have to eat and they have to, and that's, and they have to, and they make noise, and they have to be cared for. They can't be boxed up and, and left alone. They take in 24 animals a day on average, three an hour, just three new ones coming in the front door every hour. A real live, barking, needing animal. But we also, through our spay and neuter program, spayed and neutered on average five a day as well last year. Really, really proud of that, and had almost eight adoptions a day. So. Really, really proud of Corey and his team and the dramatic improvements we've seen in our, since we built our new animal shelter. <clears throat> Senior center, about a 3% budget increase. Um, seniors will be the last thing that we cut, I'm sure, across the board. Uh, pretty exciting program over there. They served over 82,000 meals to seniors last year through the nutrition program and over 10,000 volunteer hours that helped serve and deliver those, those meals. Farmington Civic Center is a little bit of an anomaly this year because we're starting the major construction at $11 million. 
$11 million renovation that's being funded through a, a specific dedicated revenue source, which is a, a fee, $2.50 per night on all hotel stays. And that money can only be spent on that. So that's just something we can do. And it's, it's been relatively pain, painless. And we're going to renovate that, uh, that this year. So we really don't know what the, our costs are going to be down and our revenues are going to be down there as well during construction. Uh, museums, about a 7% cut in the budget. Um, we also add, and that includes adding the Native American Museum this year. Police department, very proud of our police department. Again, much larger police department than you would have for a city our side, our size. Um, expenditure is about level there, uh, but there has been some cuts, but we've also though built back into this year. We're buying 15 police cars. For those of you that have noticed a little bit of the paint, Coming off of our cars, our mayor got called out in a, in a uh, and it's my fault. He's been yelling at me for not yelling, but for months about the police cars. The fact is we had to cut all, we didn't buy any fleet this year. So when we talk about these cuts, we're deferring things that need to be done. So there's, there's always a consequence to delay and deferring things that must be done. But we are purchasing 15 police cars. In fact, they are ordered today on the caveat that they cannot arrive before July 1 without blowing the budget. But um, so we're, we're happy about that. Great fire department, proud of, of Chief Page and our fire department. Again, about a 2% reduction in our fire department. Community development takes the lead on economic development. That's, that's a part of what we do locally. We do a lot of reaching out to businesses like Trader Joe. Right now we're in discussions with um, Kohl's. Again, back to that quality and quantity. We want to have the stores that people want, that are popular, that people will drive for instead of going to Albuquerque and, God forbid, going to Durango to shop. So, um, but they also handle our planning division, our building inspection. Here's how that works with Durango. You eat 75% of your meals here, no, 90% of your meals here, and then you can go have 10% of your restaurants there. That's, that's the rule for Farmington citizens. But, um, but Mary has endured some big cuts in personnel and uh, so about an 8% cut in community development. Public works, about a 3% cut this year. Uh, but in addition to the general, this is just the general fund portion. Remember I talked about those dedicated tax sources. There is about uh, $10 million that comes in through a dedicated GRT fund that can only be spent on that. And with that, I am done, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Rob. Well, as you can see, it's, it's a detailed operation. It's complex. And uh, we have a lot of people working to provide services that the people of Farmington will appreciate. And I think in general, what I hear uh, as I get out and about in the community is that people do appreciate the level of programs and services that are provided by the city of Farmington. I've talked to very few people who are out there arguing that we ought to be reducing or reining in the kinds of services and, and programs and projects that we've built up over many, many years. We've reached a place, uh, the evolution of our community. Uh, people like the community. They don't want to see it uh, torn down in any significant respect. And so that's what's been driving as a foundational principle the budgeting process for the last eight or nine years. Let's see what we can do to operate with a balanced budget, which we are required to do. But let's make every effort to defer pulling back the programs, services, projects that uh, make Farmington the place it's known to be. Uh, Farmington has a great reputation statewide in the, in the context of quality of life. Rob talked quite a bit about uh, the tax structure in Farmington and San Juan County. And, um, a couple of times made reference to the fact that we, we're very proud that we have one of the lowest tax rates in the, in the state, and we do. And I think that is something to be proud of, but I would also like to say I'm not averse to raising taxes. But I would like to raise taxes in the context of providing quality of life, not just simply to retain the status quo. And that's what we did when we implemented the two one-eighths of the Hold Harmless Taxing Authority. We were just doing that to, to fill that gap of, of lost revenue that we knew we were going to, to experience. And so we were just retaining the, uh, maintaining the status quo. 
I would like for us to use taxing authority to do something that's very positive for the community in terms of quality of life. We did that once in this community and we've received the benefit of that for many, many years and that will be extended out for many, many years as well. But that's not the environment that we live in today. And it hasn't been the environment that we've been living in for the last uh, eight to nine years. So it's a real challenge. Rob, I, I thought it might be nice if you would um, maybe introduce your key players on, on the budgeting process. I know that, again, all of the department heads play a key role in that budgeting process, but you rely on a handful of people. This is my award-winning budget team. Put it up there. Put it up there. We're proud of that. We're only one of two cities that actually have all three of these awards. They're not to be taken for granted. You, you can feel very, very confident about our accounting staff and the, account, and the, the accountability and the, and the excellent job they do, and then our budgeting teams. Annie Mason leads the whole team, administrative services. Uh, Alina Erickson is our budget analyst, analyst and uh, Teresa is our budget officer. So, great, great team. Mm -hmm. So I want to remind you that this presentation uh, is on the website. You can, you can take a, a longer look at it, a more detailed look at it. Um, Greg Allen is also videoing this presentation tonight. It'll be shown on the mayor's table. Um, and if, if, if you're not familiar with the mayor's table, and I imagine most of you are, it's a, I think it's turned out to be a good way for the city to communicate information to its citizens who are interested in what's going on in their city. Um, it's a, a program that's designed to inform. It's uh, designed to uh, create some transparency in local government. It's designed to uh, give people some level of confidence in their local government that they might not otherwise have. We, we, we have a different topic every Monday, and, uh, and I think probably it's, it's informative. I've had a lot of positive feedback. We've done it every Monday, Monday since the uh, last week of December 2015, so it's uh, about a year and a half now. And I appreciate the uh, staff people who helped put that together uh, and to help inform the public. So now we want to take what time is remaining and, uh, and entertain comments and suggestions and questions. Uh, comments and suggestions are very much appreciated. We're still in that uh, phase of the budgetary process where those kinds of things can be taken into consideration by the city council. Uh, questions, if you, have a, you know, if you have something that you don't understand, uh, maybe you want a little bit more edification about, then, then uh, don't hesitate to ask those. Did we get any written questions? Um, if there are any, you can pass those cards to the middle and we'll pick them up. But um, okay. let's, uh, let's kick it off with uh, verbal questions. And I think we're in a small enough area that if you would just stand, maybe introduce yourself. And I don't think you have to approach the microphone. So uh, let's entertain some questions. I'm going to have some hard time reading. I can do it. Okay, this is, I think, more of a, more of a, a comment than a question. Quality of life services like library, museum, river trails are of highest prior or are my highest priority. Raise taxes to increase quality of life. Yes, mayor's table. Good. All right. Well. And that, uh, that apparently was done before I made my pitch. Uh, I don't... Um, David, is that you? I, I mean, I, do you have a specific question or, uh, or concern about how we're funding those areas that, that are important to you? Uh, do you feel that we're not allocating enough funds to certain areas or uh, too much to something else? I don't want to put you on the spot, but... It always helps to get somebody engaged, and then people tend to, to join in that. So if you'll be my guinea pig. Well, I appreciated the presentation very much, and uh, thank you for all the work that all of you did on that. And uh, my own sense of being a longtime citizen here, my family's been here 100 years, <coughs> and um, is it the quality of life uh, item by the ones that, you know, the other things need to be done right? police and the fire department. And, but 
these are the things that make the kind of difference that you're talking about for economic development over time. So I think quality of life issues are not simply luxuries. They are the essential. And I think we've been uh, strong in quality of life projects in uh, the city of Far Farmington over a period of time now. It probably goes back 20 to 30 years. And I don't think we're sitting on our hands now. In this last uh, eight to nine years, uh, we're doing some things that I think enhance the quality of life uh, in Farmington, New Mexico, and San Juan County. And in turn, they enhance the strength of our local economy. Definitely, we're in a depressed economy. And that's been something that's been fluctuating uh, a little bit up, then down, uh, a little bit up, then quite a bit down over the last eight or nine years. But uh, things that we've done, like opening Farmington Lake, uh, it's something that, that uh, um, is noticed. It's appreciated. It's, uh, I was out there three or four times last year just to get a visual feel for what was going on during the summertime to get a sense for how many people are there, stop, talk to a few people. We had people coming from the Berlin and Albuquerque area. I think that will increase and people will spend not just one day, maybe they'll spend a, a day, a night, maybe two days, two nights, and we'll have heads in beds and that helps uh, some other things. Another, th and I'll give it to you in just a second, David, but another thing that we're, um, uh, we're doing is we're um, renovating and expanding the Farmington Civic Center. It's a 40-year-old facility. It's in, in, I think, some drastic need of, uh, of an overhaul, so to speak. And uh, we found a dedicated source of revenue to fund that project. And it'll be a significant change in the way that looks, inside and out. But we think that it'll be more accommodating to groups of people who want to come to Farmington, uh, who want to bring their groups for conventions, We'll have more space, uh, we'll be more attractive to that segment of our, our tourism industry and convention industry. Uh, that's being done with a surcharge on hotel room rentals. Uh, every night somebody comes into Farmington, spends a night in the local hotel, they'll pay $2.50. We've been collecting that for a little bit over a year. Well, it's actually about 20 months now, I think. And uh, so we're able to, with those proceeds, uh, fund, uh, provide debt service for about $11 million in bonds that uh, we will issue. So uh, we're, we're talking about uh, now finding an alternative to Brookside Pool, uh, an, an iconic facility in Farmington. I was going to Brookside Pool, walking there from my home when I was about eight, nine, ten years old. And you may have been there as well, David. Uh, and others in this community may have, uh, have uh, been at, Brook, at Brookside Pool. But we're in the process now of uh, considering refinancing, uh, refunding outstanding bonded indebtedness to generate about seven million, six to seven million dollars. Uh, about five million of that would be allocated to an aquatic facility. Uh, all of the, the test cases that we've looked at, uh, test cases being other communities have done something similar, indicate that those can pay for themselves. Uh, the operating costs can be covered by, by the fees of admission. And we think that if it's done right, that it will be a regional draw into Farmington and uh, boost local economic development to some extent. So just a few things that we're doing even in this, uh, the realm of significant fiscal challenges. David? You know? Over the last five years, a very large percentage of our business, they're going to this stuff. Ten or fifteen years ago, who heard of this stuff? And so some of these things that are natural resources are really very important for this spreading out of the kind of thing they're talking about for economic development. And the Chocolate Canyon has long been a place people are coming to. Lots of people we have somebody here from Holland the other day who's come to this side three times <laughs> across the last five years. They keep coming back to this side yeah. from Holland. <laughs> well, I think the time will be right again at some point uh, in the future for us to consider a tax increase uh, to fund quality of life projects. I was pretty well on my way to that about two years ago when uh, I think 2014, 2015, we had some fairly significant uh, 
bumps in our local economy and in, in uh, revenue generation through gross receipts taxation and thinking that, that maybe that would be a sustained trend. But then all of a sudden we, we had this, this second significant drop and, uh, and began to feel very challenged by a lot of things. R dropping revenues, the threat of legislative action that could, could uh, create significant issues for us once again. Uh, depends on how the legislature handles the home har hold harmless issue. Um, that, that, as Rob indicated, could be a very dramatic problem for local government across the state, particularly for the city of Farmington. But I, I do believe that there will be a time when uh, we can may more seriously begin to talk about uh, a gross receipts uh, a tax increase that uh, would be something you could sell to the community as a very positive thing. It wouldn't be just retain, to, to retain the status quo, to retain the programs, services that we have, it would be to actually do something new and beneficial for our community. Again, I'd love to be able to convert the, the 218 hold harmless taxation that we imposed a couple of years. I'd love to convert that to a quarter of 1% quality of life gross receipts tax. That'd be ideal. And, and you know, we may get a result out of this legislative session, the special session that will occur in uh, the next two weeks probably, we may get a result that we really like there. Uh, it could take a lot, a lot of different forms, but there is one result that I think could be very, very meaningful. One of the things that is likely to happen is that the state is probably going to become much more aggressive about collecting gross receipts tax on internet sales transactions. Now, I don't know what all of you think about that, but in my mind, that's a, a bit of a game changer if that happens, and if those monies can be traced back to the point of origin of the transaction. Now, my concern is that state's gonna just keep that money that they get, and it's not, it's not gonna find its way back to where Carol Clore ordered whatever it is she orders on the internet. Um, but uh, I, do, I do think that that could be a very significant boost to municipality uh, tax revenues. Um, I buy locally. Uh, you're good for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've heard other people say that and then come to find out they, they have some exceptions along the way. And, uh, um, any other comments, questions? Bob? Those are going to be great future um, projects that we'll develop once our economy recovers and we'll be able to build trails and, and uh, put bridges across those uh, areas. But that would be a, a, a real uh, boon for our community. And, and I just, I think uh, we have some forward uh, looking council and, and uh, you, you all have uh, made this. Uh, very worthwhile for the future generations of our community. I want to thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Bob. And that was something I actually thought of and then I forgot it as, as I was talking. But it is another example of the fact that we haven't been sitting on our hands during the last eight or nine years. We've been, been taking some very positive steps where we can while, while budgeting and spending prudently. Um, but, you know, we all have big ideas and we have a wish list of things that I think, um, if I recall correctly, totaled about 170 million. That's a short list. That's a short list. So the, the, the long list is much more expensive than that. But we, we have some needs in our community. Um, we, um, we're doing the best we can, but we always appreciate the comments, the suggestions about how we might do it better. Um, again, we'll entertain more questions and comments. Um, if, if we don't have any, uh, I would, I would think that it might be interesting for you in the remaining about 10 minutes that we have to understand why it is that we have a bit of optimism about this next 12 months, the, uh, the uh, July 1st to Ju June 30th fiscal year 18 uh, budget and, and what we, why we think that we might see a bump in gross receipts tax revenue of 4.5% 
Uh, that's not indicative of what we've seen in the, in the last year to 18 months. But Rob, I, I think between the two of us, we can, we can talk a little bit about the basis and the foundation for that uh, bit of optimism out there that uh, is helping us to create a balanced, bu balanced budget uh, for, the, for the next fiscal year. And I, and I think what we're, uh, one thing that we see as a positive is the transfer of ownership of the assets of ConocoPhillips. Now, some people are looking at that and they're saying, uh, you know, how can that be a good thing? Uh, we've been hearing that, that Hillcorp, the purchaser of, of those assets for about $3 billion, is going to fairly significantly uh, decrease their, their personnel in the Farmington area. And one of the numbers has been about 200 employees may lose jobs. Those would be uh, behind the desk type folks primarily. They need their field people to, to manage and operate those assets in the field. Um, if, that's a, if that's a worst case scenario, then we need to think about that. How do we recover from the loss of 200 jobs? Rob and I had dinner with the five of the six uh, uh, top management people at Hillcorp uh, a week ago, Tuesday night. And we had a chance to visit in detail with them about their outlook on the Farmington asset or the San Juan Basin assets that they just acquired and their, their attitudes towards corporate citizenship, the kinds of things that I would be interested in as mayor of the community. And we both walked away from that uh, meeting very, very impressed with these people and what they have planned for the, for the area. They will, they indicate they will spend uh, four to five times more money than ConocoPhillips uh, was spending in the community. Now, it's important to understand what that base is because ConocoPhillips was really sitting on their assets uh, uh, for the last couple of years. And, uh, and they, um, but the, I think even if we take a look at uh, some of the more recent uh, spending by by ConocoPhillips, say three or four years ago, Hillcorp is saying they'll, they'll uh, four to five times that, quadruple or quintuple that in 2018, in calendar year 2018. Uh, now this deal is supposed to close about July, I think on July 31st, they're doing a lot of title examination and due diligence between now and then to close on that date. For the last five months of 2017, they would be looking at just uh, taking an inventory of things, where, where they want to be. They do a lot of work over work, but probably wouldn't stand up any drilling rigs in the latter part of 2017. But in 2018, um, they indicated that they would be somewhat active in drilling new wells. So, you know, if they were doing enough work to stand up, let's just say three rigs and keep three rigs working for uh, a good part of 2018, each of those rigs is going to employ about 100 direct jobs. And these are pretty good paying jobs in our community. So you've got maybe 300 jobs there. At worst case, if they, if they cut their workforce locally by 200, we've still got a net gain there. We don't think it's gonna be as bad as 200 job losses as a result of that transaction. But again, just talking worst case scenario. Uh, for every, direct job, there's an indirect job somewhere in the community. So there's a trickle down impact on the employment base in the community. Uh, I was very impressed with their attitude towards uh, philanthropy and, and uh, corporate citizenship. So that's one thing that I would say encourages me about uh, what's going to happen in 2018 or fiscal year uh, 2018, July 1st of 2017 to June 30th of 2018. Rob, uh, talk about some of the other things that uh, you factored into your recommendation. Well, you know, that's a big piece of it. It's the general optimism we're hearing from that industry. Our other industries have, have remained solid and, in fact, are expanding. So if oil and gas picks back up, we've got four rigs working now. When we had zero, not very long ago, we're seeing a lot of independent operators report good news of, of equipment out in the field. Um, so there's just quite a few reports of good things. Yeah. That's probably the biggest, biggest piece of that one sector picking up because the others have been doing well. I think the, the, the best opportunity in economic development in San Juan County is in the tourism industry. Uh, the Four Corners Economic Development Service, as Rob mentioned, is we consider it to be the economic development arm of the city of Farmington and we fund it accordingly. 
Uh, they've identified six target areas uh, for recruitment of new industry and expansion uh, of and, and uh, retention of existing business. Economic development in an isolated place like Farmington, New Mexico is a tough job. I've been engaged in it for the last 10 years. And we had high hopes that uh, we could replace the 5,000 jobs that were lost in the oil and gas industry between 2008 and 2010. We had high hopes that we would be able to replace those jobs over a 10 year period of time. That is not happening. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons why it's not happening. But one reason is that it's difficult to recruit new industry and uh, manufacturing, for example. We just don't have the major infrastructure, transportation infrastructure that those kinds of businesses look for. We don't have a navigable water. We don't have a railroad. We don't have major airline service, major airport. Uh, some would question whether we have the, the uh, road infrastructure uh, to facilitate that as well, although 550 is fairly nice and can, can handle that kind of traffic these days. Tourism, we know we have the natural resources right here in our backyard. And uh, the council is going to be putting some extra emphasis on outdoor rec recreation. We're going to be engaging with Four Corners Economic Development Service to, uh, to begin to focus more strategically and aggressively on development of the tourism industry. We know we have the assets there, the resources. It's just a matter, I think, of, 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 of getting the right minds together to develop a plan to move forward with it. And uh, I think there's a niche there that we need to explore and take advantage of. Um, frankly, the uh, extractive industries are going to be a, a foundation, continue to be a foundation of our local economy. Um, but there are a lot of challenges there and we have to be uh, preparing for uh, the, 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 the many changes that are occurring in the extractive industries. We know that coal uh, is significantly challenged. Uh, we know that the renewables are becoming more viable economically. We need to be planning along those ways. We, we, we have uh, plans to do a community solar project in, um, in Farmington. That's currently being vetted uh, um, uh, by our utility department and, uh, and we think we're gonna have some, some feedback on that in the next, what, Rob, two, two months to three months, probably. And I think we're having some engagement at the, at the city level about um, undertaking that kind of a project, even if the reaction from the citizens is, is not as aggressive as we'd like it to be. Uh, we're talking about a third of a megawatt to a half a megawatt um, solar project. We know that we, we've got businesses that are looking more seriously at solar. Um, uh, the hospital is uh, engaged uh, very actively in uh, putting about one and a half megawatts uh, on, on board. Is it Walmart, Walmart that's looking? We have a target. Is target is looking. Uh, there'll be another ma major business that is likely to move in that direction. Uh, we suspect that uh, there'll be growth in solar uh, residential as well as the costs keep coming down. But, you know, I think we're, we're, uh, we're going to be a, we're going to be a, an oil and gas town. Uh, we have those assets. We need to take advantage of them. Natural gas is plentiful here uh, with the right pricing for, for natural gas. Uh, that could create another mini boom in our community as well. But uh, uh, a lot of things to consider. It's a very complex process and uh, we, we hope that uh, in the course of time that uh, you're learning a bit about the challenges that the city faces uh, on an annual basis and just making ends meet. Um, I'll open it up again for other questions or comments or suggestions before we close. Well, this speaks well for Rob, I think. He's, a he's answered most of your questions. Again, we appreciate this very much uh, that you've taken the time to come here. Uh, if you wanna look at, at any of this again, the mayor's table will be uh, We'll be putting out there. Greg, when will that, when will we air? Monday morning. Oh, we're going to do that uh, next Monday. Start at Monday morning. Okay. All right. All right. Um, thanks again. We'll look forward to this again next year.